www.ghanaeconomyhappening.online. And thank you very much uh, for your participation tonight. Give me one second now. Okay. Uh, we will start in, in, in one minute. In one minute only. Um, dear colleagues, uh, this program tonight is uh, chaired by my colleague, Dr. Ahmed Abdul Hati. Dr. Ahmed Abdul Hati is graduated from, uh, uh, in, in 2003 from Egypt. He obtained the uh, master's degree in 2009 and the medical doctorate degree in 2016. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdul uh, obtained the European Diploma of Intensive Care and Anesthesia uh, in 2016. And uh, since that, he moved to Ireland uh, and he uh, gained his um, fellowship of the College of Anesthesiologists, which is the top um, qualification in, in Ireland. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdul Hati occupying now uh, one of the highest training jobs in Ireland, which is a senior clinical fellow in intensive care medicine. He acquired that job in Matar University Hospital, and then he moved to Tala University Hospital. He's preparing himself to take a senior um, uh, senior uh, role as a consultant of anesthesia and intensive care very shortly. Uh, Dr. Ahmed al is a very good achiever, and he's preparing a master in simulation and vision safety. Uh, I'm so lucky to have such an achiever man tonight to chair this uh, uh, program tonight. All the best and thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saad, for these nice words. And um, I'm going to start. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you tonight to one of our weekly online series. On behalf of the Educational Board of the Mega Medical Association and the Education Society of Anesthesiology, I would like to welcome the speakers and attendees to this creative and prestigious continuous opportunity to deliver not only an up-to-date curriculum in the field of anesthesiology, critical care medicine, and pain, but also to gather unique speakers and moderators from all over the globe. This opportunity is and will remain a great and successful experience in the current and the future virtual learning, especially during the current pandemic. Please let me introduce our first speaker today, Professor John Doyle. Uh, Dr. Doyle is with the Department of General Anesthesiology, Cleveland Clinic, as well uh, as a professor of anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Doyle um, has received his MD degree in 1982 and his PhD degree in biomedical engineering in 1986. Both from the University of Toronto, he received his Canadian board certification in anesthesia FRCPC in 1986 and his American certification in 1989. Dr. Doyle has a long-standing interest in ENT anesthesia and difficult airway management, as well as an interest in the use of technology in medicine. His research has been supported by a number of funding agencies, and he holds his positions on a number of editorial boards. Dr. Doyle is past president of both the Society of Airway Management and Society for Technology in Anesthesia. He has received clinical teaching awards on uh, four occasions. Today, Dr. Doyle, uh, Dr. Doyle is going to speak to us about the history of airway management. Dr. Doyle, you may start. Thank you, Ahmed, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, I wanna make sure that everyone can see the screen here. Let me click on share. And if everything's all right, I will get started. So this is a companion presentation to deal with the presentation from two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we talked about the history of anesthesia. And today we're going to talk about the history of clinical airway management. And it's no surprise, of course, that these two are intertwined in important ways. But as you can see, airway management has changed uh, very much across the ages. We'll talk about some of the instrumentation shown on the left. But now we're often exposed to more advanced instrumentation of the airway, such as video laryngoscopy that we see commonplace and is shown on the right. 
I want to give due credit for one of the most valuable resources I used for this historical review. And this was from one of my colleagues, Dr. John Davidson, when I was at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, he published this article from Anesthesiology Clinics of North America, Intubation, What's Old, What's New, from uh, some 26 years ago. And it's a very nice historical account of the history of intubation. Indeed, you can see here from this illustration that there are many landmarks in the history of clinical airway management. In biblical times, we knew about death from airway obstruction, and this was recognized. This might be caused by strangulation, by abscesses, by leprosy, and we'll see a biblical explanation of this in a while. In the 1700s, we had metal and leather tubes inserted blindly into the trachea for the treatment of drowning or for other purposes. And then this became connected to anesthesia with Crawford Long discovering ether anesthesia, 1842. Garcia, a professor of singing, developed indirect laryngoscopy, and we'll cover that in a little while. And then we're going to talk, cover the history of diphtheria, where O'Dwyer popularized intubation for diphtheria, but also a comment on the antitoxins. And then Kirsten develops direct laryngoscopy. Kuhn developed flexometallic tracheal tubes. Chevalier Jackson developed an improved laryngoscope. In fact, he's one of the greatest laryngoscopists of all time. Griffiths introduced Carrari into clinical practice in the 1840s. And then in the 19, uh, 1950s, we had popularization of the use of tracheal tubes for general anesthesia, followed by the advent of advanced patient monitoring. And <clears throat> there were continuing improvements in laryngoscope and tube designs from the 1940s to the 1970s until we developed the now implant tested low irritation, low cuff pressure disposable tracheal tubes that are present to this day. 1980 saw the popularization of fiber optic intubation, the 1990s, the development of new laryngoscopes and in particular guidance for airway management, such as the ASA practice guidelines that uh, are now in its third or fourth generation, depending on which part of the literature you follow. The founding of the Society of Airway Management from 25 years ago is another important historical note. And this plus the Difficult Airway Society and other air societies have been producing guidance for clinical management. So this in one chart is a series of important landmarks for clinical airway management. But let's go back to the uh, Old Testament uh, where Elijah is shown here reviving the son of the widow here, this uh, son, let's get a look. Uh, uh, Elijah performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on a child who apparently had heat stroke. And this was the first example of assisted respiration. So the account goes, and he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. So this is believed to be the first description of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But there have been many other instances of biblical and religious accounts pertaining to airway management. St. Blaise served as the Bishop of Armenia in the fourth century. Little is known about his life, but legend tells us that he saved a small boy from choking on a fishbone, a problem that still occurs to this day. Because of this, his help is sought for those who are afflicted by illnesses of the throat. And on February 3, the Feast of St. Blaise, many Catholic churches offer the blessing of the throats as shown here on the right. And you can see the two candles that are presented in formation for the throat. And here is an up close view of this for blessing the throat. Um, in the case of Homer, the famous author, uh, he described the death of Hector and he wrote that his spear went right through the fleshy part of the neck, but did not sever his windpipe, so he could still speak. And Aristotle, in his book, Parts of the Animals, showed a sophisticated appreciation of the structure and function of the epiglottis, the vocal cords, and the trachea. Alexander the Great, um, one of the most famous uh, leaders of all time. Uh, Alberti, the uh, ENT doctor, recommended uh, uh, to understand that Alexander the Great opened up the trachea of a soldier given up for dead with the point of his dagger and established an airway in that way. This is an article, uh, Tracheostomy versus Intubation, a 19th century controversy. Balti also mentions that Hippocrates described and used an angled tube 
to relieve airway obstruction caused by quincy, which is basically superglottitis. He also condemned tracheostomies, citing threat to carotid arteries. And as we know now, careful attention to the anatomy will eliminate this risk. In uh, the Middle East, Avicenia, the Arab physician described airway management in his treatise, Liber Canonis. And he writes, when necessary, a cannula of gold, silver, or other suitable material is advanced down the throat to support inspiration. Another important player in the history of the airways is Valasius. He developed the first genuine anatomy text based on dissection of the human body. And this was very popular uh, based on the excellent woodcuts that were shown, such as those illustrated on the right. Uh, and the anatomy became much clearer for those people who wanted to do surgical airway management. As an example, here is an ancient grave, uh, engraving illustrating a tracheostomy procedure uh, from this book from 1666. And you can see on the upper left, the patient who's struggling with uh, an obstructed airway. And you can see a vertical incision is made. It is opened up uh, and then the appliance is introduced through a hole in the trachea, typically between the second and third tracheal rings for classical um, uh, tracheostomies. But for in the case of uh, cricothyroidomies through the cricothyroid membrane. Now here, it was not till 1788 that an indisputable reference to oral tracheal intubation in humans had occurred. Charles Kite, in his essay on the recovery of apparently dead, writes, the crooked tube bent like a male catheter should be introduced into the glottis through the mouth or one nostril. And this is 1788. And in a while, we'll show you what the catheter looked like. Here are some instruments for the recovery of the uh, apparently dead shown from that time. The elastic blowpipe uh, for the lungs is shown, the elastic tube of black leather containing medicines into the stomach, as well as other products. The idea is that you would be able to ventilate the lungs in this manner. This is the recommended curved metal catheter recommended by uh, Charles Kite that I uh, made mention of just a few slides ago. Here's an interesting story of inadvertent awake intubation. The Parisian surgeon Salt was responsible for demonstrating the ability of a conscious patient to tolerate the indwelling or tracheal tube. He did this inadvertently, thinking that he had passed the tube into the esophagus for the purposes of providing nourishment, but a flickering of a lighted candle at the end of the tube demonstrated the tube's intratracheal position. Another description that we have is blind intubation for drowning. In their 1796 description of life measures for drowning patients, they advised placing a catheter blindly over the fingers place posterior to the epiglottis, blind intubation, using your fingers as a guide. Now, one of the most interesting diseases that has had an impact on airway management is diphtheria. It's an upper airway tract illness characterized by sore throat, low-grade fever, and a pseudomembrane, an inherent membrane on the tonsils. And this membrane can obstruct the airway. So it's caused by Cornybacterium diphtheriae, aerobic gram-positive bacterium shown on the right. So a pseudomembrane is formed at the back, um, typically of a child. The membrane can grow and extend further down the throat, suffocating the victim. In the, 19, uh, in the 1890s, the German physician Emil von uh, Bering developed an antitoxin that, although it did not kill the bacteria, it neutralized the toxic poisons that the bacteria released into the body. For this discovery and his development of the serum therapy for diphtheria, he won the first ever Nobel Prize in 1901. So the treatment uh, was an antitoxin, but there still was a problem with that adherent membrane that could cause suffocation. In February 1925, a deadly diphtheria epidemic was poised to sweep through Nome, Alaska, the northern part of the U.S., the only serum that could stop the outbreak was in Anchorage, Alaska, 700 miles away. The only aircraft that could deliver the medicine was taken out of winter storage, but its engine was frozen, could not start. So after considering all the alternatives, officials decided to move the medicine along using a series of sled dogs for the whole 700 mile journey. And 
This lead dog, his name is Balto, is uh, commemorated here in Central Park in New York because this uh, lead dog led the team for the 700 mile journey to provide the antitoxin to Nome, Alaska. Later on in late 1928, an outbreak of diphtheria occurred in Northern Alberta, Canada. And in January, 1929, two individuals headed to Edmonton in the Avro Avian uh, aircraft shown here with the necessary diphtheria antitoxin. Their flight path took them first to McClung where they spent the night and then on to Peace River for refueling. They headed north uh, to Fort Vermilion and despite dangerously frigid weather and engine problems, the two pilots arrived safely with the antitoxin and returned three days later to a cheering crowd of 10,000 people. So this was the antitoxin delivered. This is an open cockpit aircraft, maximum speed 102 miles an hour, cruise speed 87 miles an hour. And the key thing is that it had limited range, only 400 miles. And the problem was keeping warm in these Canadian winter conditions. So one of the first early effective treatments was discovered in the 1880s by Joseph O'Dwyer, who I'd like to tell you more about. He developed tubes that could be inserted into the throat of diphtheria victims uh, or other victims. Um, and the idea was that you could establish an airway in this way. And it was a blind instrument shown here where you try to insert this device into the glottic aperture to keep it open. And so here we see an illustration of how it is done. The device was introduced blindly into the glottic aperture uh, with some wires coming out or strings coming out that allow you to remove it later. But you can see one of the challenges here is that the victim could bite on the finger of the caregiver uh, causing them to get diphtheria as well. Uh, so here are some of the instruments that were used, a gag, an introducer, and other things, as well as a device for extracting this airway device. Uh, here is a figure from the book Intubation of the Larynx, showing the proper position for a patient for successful intubation. So the child who is obstructing their airway would be seated in the lap of mother, and then one would try and intubate the trachea posteriorly. And this would be an alternative to a tracheostomy. Here is a device that went over your finger so that when you try to insert this device, when the a child bit down on you, you would be protected by this, by this product and prevent you from getting diphtheria yourself. Other developments in intubation occurred and Trendelenburg, uh, the famous German surgeon responsible for the Trendelenburg position and many other innovations, he adapted to human use, a method of delivering chloroform via tracheostomy tube, allowing them to pack off the pharynx and prevent the aspiration of blood during oral and nasal procedures. Another development was McEwen, a Glasgow surgeon. He was the first to administer endotracheal anesthesia. His first case involved resection of a massive oral tumor following awake intubation without local anesthesia. This cocaine had not entered into clinical practice until 1884, some six years later. McEwen's second and third cases involved intubation for laryngeal edema following aspiration of pieces of hot potato. In the second oral tumor case, the patient could not tolerate the endotracheal tube after placement. Remember, this was done without local anesthesia and begged to get chloroform prior to another attempt. McEwen acceded to the patient's request, gave chloroform, but the patient died on induction of anesthesia from an unrestricted airway. Here is a sample of the McEwen tube and he used both gum elastic and flexo-metallic type tubes inserted into the glottic aperture. Another innovator from Germany, influenced by the works of McEwen and Aguirre, Franz Kuhn, uh, 1902, invented an endotracheal tube that was flexible, easy to insert, and resisted kinking. And a fitted stylet made for the tube um, made for uh, blind insertion. An earpiece attachment even allowed for the auscultation of breath sounds. And you can see the earpiece right there. So you could do auscultation and that would help Ian monitor the patient. Here is the device. You can see it's a flexo-metallic device put in with an introducer, but also shown there is a means to deliver your anesthetic agent into the dome. 
Here is the intubation kit with a preformed metal stylet. Uh, comes from the collection of instruments from uh, Vienna, uh, Austria. Another technique that was in commonplace was insufflation. In the years leading up to World War I, considerable interest in anesthesia by ether insufflation had developed using this kind of insufflation catheter. In the early 1920s, McGill reintroduced the concept of a large caliber tube allowing bidirectional gas flow instead of using the narrow bore insufflation catheter. And McGill also invented McGill forceps and popularized blind nasal intubation. Here is a McGill intratracheal uh, catheter showing both e uh, insufflation and egress ports. So this would go inside the trachea. And then a big development occurred with improvements in laryngoscopy and that changed the landscape in important ways. And so let's take a look at the history of laryngoscopy. It all begins with a nun clinician, Manuel Garcia, a professor of singing at the Paris Conservatory, used a system of mirrors to vocalize his own vocal cords during phonation. This was 1854, and again, before the advent of local anesthesia. So he was interested in the mechanics of phonation, and he developed an instrument that allowed one to see the larynx. So he began with indirect laryngoscopy. You can see the mirror here, uh, the tongue being pulled out. And then with the uh, appropriate use of lighting, you can see what's going on through the mirror. Later on, new developments with indirect laryngoscopy occurred with, for example, this bivalved laryngeal speculum with a mirror built in, another way of seeing what's going on. But in due course, direct laryngoscopy became more popular and more valuable. Here is Kirstein's autoscope showing two blades. You can attach which either blade you want. This brings us to 1897. And you can see here uh, how was how the procedure was carried out. By this time, uh, topical anesthesia using cocaine was available and made the whole process somewhat easier. Here's Kirstein's book, Autoscopy of the Larynx and the Trachea, subtitled Direct Examination Without a Mirror. And this book from 1897 is available for anyone who wants to download it from Google Books. If you're interested in the history of, uh, of airway management, uh, this nice uh, book available from Google Books comes with a signature from the author himself. Here's the interesting thing that was uh, pertinent at the times, an instrument for passing a ligature through the epiglottis to lift it out of the way. So uh, we now put in an indirect um, we now put in uh, our direct laryngoscope into the molecula uh, to advance the epiglottis out of the way. But here you could actually put in a ligature and lift it out of the way for some forms of clinical airway management. Another form of laryngoscope was developed by Chevalier Jackson, one of the greatest, if not the greatest laryngologists of all time. And he developed so many different kinds of laryngoscopy. Here is suspension laryngoscopy that uh, he popularized. And this is the view obtained with suspension laryngoscopy. And he published a book called Bronchoscopy and Esophagoscopy. In fact, a variety of books uh, here. This brings us to 1922. So we are more or less exactly 100 years away now. So his books, also available free uh, download from Google, uh, have a lot of suggestions that are true even to this day. Following laryngoscopy, and the development of the Macintosh and Miller laryngoscopes that we're familiar with in the 1940s. Another important development was various kinds of superglottic airways, such as the laryngeal mask airway. And this is perhaps the, the last in the series of important developments for uh, airway management, that and the development of video laryngoscopy. So the LMA, as we know, uh, is designed to provide an oval seal around the laryngeal inlet once the LMA is inserted and the cuff inflated, when inserted, it lies at the crossroads of the digestive and respiratory tract. So here's a nice illustration of that. Uh, this was a technique developed by Archie Brain. And on the right, you can see a variety of variants that uh, have been developed over time. In addition to his original reusable classic product and single use products, he developed a variety of uh, superglottic airways intended for various kinds of uses, such as, for example, on the right, 
that one could intubate through. One interesting technology related to supraglottic airways that we no longer have available, the LMA seat track allowed you to see the glottic aperture when you placed it and even allowed you to pass tubes through that orifice into the, uh, uh, into the glottic aperture under direct vision. But this is a product no longer commonly available. Here are some of the variety of uh, LMA prototypes uh, that Archie Brain worked on. He made a great number of these various prototypes and worked with uh, various kinds of um, radiographic imaging as well as with cadavers to try and get his initial design just right. So there was a lot of work that went into the development of his product. And so uh, in the 1980s, Archie uh, Brain was able to patent uh, the uh, artificial airway device known as the laryngeal mask airway or laryngeal mask. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that uh, he filed in 1982. It was uh, uh, provided in 1985. This is a U.S. patent, but he also patented other countries. But on the bottom here, you can see a reference to a document called Leach. Uh, here is the description of his superglottic airway, his laryngeal mask. Uh, and go back to the document with Leach. What is this Leach document? Well, if you go back, he invented a thing from um, uh, 1936 called the pharyngeal bulb airway. And it was in many respects, the very first superglottic airway. And it did not really pass the test of time. It got reinvented as the superglottic airway that, uh, that Archie Brain invented. And here it is in description. You can see the pharyngeal bulb, uh, bulb airway shown here fits um, in a superglottic manner, but it didn't have a cuff as such that was inflatable, um, but it was used uh, for a number of years before it faded away from the clinical world. Uh, but here it is described in 1937 in anesthesia and analgesia, the pharyngeal bulb uh, gas airway, a new aid to cyclopropane anesthesia. So this was sometimes used with cyclopropane anesthesia. Uh, and as you know, cyclopropane um, has the disadvantage that it's highly explosive, meaning that if you use cautery, you can get an explosion. Um, and so uh, cyclopropane eventually faded away as uh, halothane became available. And here is an x-ray uh, showing the, uh, the uh, gas uh, pharyngeal bulb gas way in place, just to showing how sometimes important historical developments are based on others. Uh, there's been many more recent important developments in clinical airway management that because they are more recent are not really history, but will form the basis for historical discussions in the future. We have fiber optic intubation, which uh, became popular in the late seventies and early eighties and then popularized even more as we got more uh, experience in difficult airways and awake intubation. Video laryngoscopes, such as the uh, McGrath, as well as um, other video laryngoscopes such as uh, around the world have changed the landscape in important ways and the development of airway algorithms. Another important development, the ASA difficult airway algorithm, first described in 1993, uh, republished in 2003, republished again in 2013, and we are waiting for the fourth edition of that airway algorithm to come out. Meanwhile, airway algorithms have come out from the UK, from Canada, from China, uh, and many other countries that reflect the resources available in those various nations. So that brings to an end our discussion of the history of clinical airway management. I wanna thank you for time, your time, and I will stay uh, online uh, for subsequent questions um, at the end of this session or at the end of, uh, uh, at, at the end of the whole session. Uh, thank you very much again. Yeah. 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 It is better to take questions uh, at the end of the lecture, Dr. Ahmed, please. Yeah, so um, nothing in the box here, but I have a question uh, for Prof. Dial. Is there any superiority uh, of any of the video laryngoscope devices over the other? Um, 
That's a difficult question because it will depend to some extent on practical things like uh, cost. Uh, for example, my favorite video learning scope is the, uh, the new GlideScope that's come out, uh, but it's rather expensive compared to some of the uh, simpler portable ones. Uh, the McGrath video learning scope is the one that's our go-to video learning scope because it's nice and compact. We can open the drawer and pull it out. Uh, the primary advantage of it is it's portable and it's easy to use, and you can use it for ordinary laryngoscopy for training. It doesn't have a hyperangulated blade. And some people prefer a hyperangulated blade for a very anterior larynx. And in that setting, you might find that uh, video laryngoscopes such as the GlideScope, depending on which kind of blade you use, might be appropriate. Uh, in addition, a number of other manufacturers can offer you various kinds of, of, of blades that you can select, uh, stores, for example. So it's hard to know in any serious scientific way which is the best one. There are a number of products available and you have enthusiasts for all of them. And some of them are more suitable for special circumstances, uh, for example, anterior larynx than, for example, for routine use. Okay. Um, I have another uh, question here. So uh, when are we going to have a 3D video uh, laryngoscope? Um, so the question, what about a 3D video laryngoscope? Um, the Manufacturers would ask, number one, is there a need? Uh, and how much extra use can you get uh, compared to ordinary video laryngoscopy? Um, it would be nice if you had a video laryngoscope that was in some way linked to a CT scan for difficult airways. Uh, these are all things that people are wondering about for future technologies. But it's not clear to us that a 3D technology uh, is needed in most cases. For, for some people, their approach is if it's a difficult airway, let me review the CTs and the nasopharyngoscope examinations, and then I'm just going to do it awake fiber optically. For many people, it's just awake fiber optic. And if that doesn't work and it's really a difficult airway because of tumor, then we'll do a tracheostomy under local. So many people, in the really complex cases, just those two options. Yeah. And another uh, question. We related to that. So uh, when are we going to have a robotic airway management device for clinical use? When are we going to have a robotic airway device for clinical use? Uh, uh, robotic intubation has been described. It's in the literature. Uh, a study came out showing its use uh, in a mannequin uh, out of McGill University. And uh, you can imagine that might be of interest but there are some people, some of my clinician friends, who simply say that's all well and good, but what we need to concentrate is uh, on better clinical decision making uh, for the people who are faced with difficult airways. Uh, artificial intelligence might be best focused on it advising about approach to airway management instead of doing it robotically. Other people are saying if you have the CT scan, and you have electronic navigation, you should be able to develop artificial intelligence that will automatically advance the tube into the right position based on the CT scan. So there's people thinking about that, but this is all next generation or, or future stuff. Okay. Um, another question, uh, how to overcome the problems of hyper-acute angle depleted videoscope? Uh, so one of the problems with an, a hyperacute angle is that when you pass the endotracheal tube, it hits the anterior tracheal wall and wouldn't budge from there. That's the, perhaps the most common example. And there are some special techniques that can be used and they're described in the literature. Um, an example of that is when my tube hits the anterior tracheal wall because of my hyper, uh, hyperangulated blade, I will pull back the stylet by five centimeters and that softens the tip and allows it to advance. Uh, and then sometimes we'll, um, take out the stylet completely and then rotate the tube 300, uh, I should say 180 degrees. So it, a tip goes from an anterior position to a posterior position. These are all examples of tricks that are described. Uh, in one of our articles, we described a dozen of these tricks uh, that can be useful for anyone who likes the glide scope and it's hyperangulated blade. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, the last question. Uh, do you think using classic direct laryngoscopes or only video laryngoscopes is more educational for the trainees? So that's a debate that will never end. 
So some of my colleagues say, start off with direct laryngoscopy and then switch over to video laryngoscopy. And I teach the exact opposite. I teach that we should start off our medical students with video laryngoscopy so that they are intimately familiar with the structures. It gets them to easier to see what's going on. And then I will introduce direct laryngoscopy later because direct laryngoscopy requires uh, more skill than video laryngoscopy. And if they do not get a good view of the epiglottis, at least they'll be able to recognize the epiglottis uh, with direct laryngoscopy, having familiarized them uh, with it by video laryngoscopy. So two big camps and they can't agree with each other. And there's some people want to get rid of direct laryngoscopy completely. They think it's a waste of time. We've got video laryngoscopy, it's so much better. We can get rid of direct laryngoscopy, they would argue, uh, just like we can get rid of uh, uh, um, abacuses to do our arithmetic. Thank you. Um, that was nicely illustrated, uh, the Prof. Doyle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, our second speaker tonight is Dr. Adel Hamada. Dr. Hamada is currently working as an assistant consultant pulmonary medicine in King Abdullah Medical City, Mecca, Saudi Arabia. He holds a, a bachelor degree in medicine and surgery, master's MD in pulmonary diseases from uh, Zagzag University, Egypt. He also holds European Diploma of Intensive Care from Euro European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. He's a specialist uh, certificate examination from uh, the UK and so the fellowship in pulmonary medicine. He is a pulmonary medicine consultant and a former lecturer of pulmonary medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Zagreb University, Egypt. Dr. Hamada is going to speak about hypoxemia and oxygen therapy. So you may start, Dr. Hamada. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your kind of presentation. And thank you, Dr. Saad, for your invitation to this mega learning activity. Uh, today, inshallah, today we will discuss, uh, inshallah, uh, a topic that uh, every healthcare worker is facing uh, every day, which is uh, hypoxemia and ocean therapy in acutely ill patients. By the end of this presentation, we will recognize how ocean is transported to tissues, understand the principles of ocean delivery and what factors affect oxygenation, formulate the mechanisms of hypoxemia and how to correct it in a pragmatic approach, explore different non-invasive devices used to deliver oxygen, and know the indications and limitations of high flow nether cannula, and perfectly prescribe oxygen, and apply all these principles to our clinical practice. Oxygen cascade. Oxygen movement down the partial barrier gradient from the inspired air till the cell, bathing through the respiratory tract, alveolar gas, arterial blood, and systemic capillaries. Here is the uh, oxygen pressure in the dry atmospheric pressure. And when the, the, the air is fully humidified by water vapor, this is the pressure of oxygen in the inspired uh, airway. And this is the alveolar oxygen tension. And this is the alveolar oxygen tension going down to the level of mitochondria reaching around 10 millimeter mercury. We'll start the oxygen cascade by oxygen at dry air at sea level. Pressure of any gas equal the percentage of this gas multiplied by total pressure of the gas. So in dry air, oxygen constitutes around 21% of the air, and the partial pressure of gas, which is one atmospheric pressure, equals 760 millimeter mercury. So the pressure of oxygen in dry air at sea level equal 159 millimeter mercury. So low barometric pressure like in high altitude and the flying will decrease the oxygen tension, while high barometric pressure like in deep diving and the high barbaric oxygen will increase it. Fully, uh, oxygen at fully humidified air at 37 degrees centigrade 
as air goes through the respiratory tract, it will be 100% saturated with water vapor, which will affect the inspired PO2 as follows. The oxygen tension in humidified air at sea level equal also 21% multiplied by the barom barometric pressure minus the water vapor pressure. So it will be 21% multiplied by 760 minus 47, which is water vapor pressure, which will be equal 150 millimeter mercury. Alvar oxygen tension and alvar gas equation. This is the airway. This is the alveolus. So the inspired oxygen tension will be 150 millimeter mercury uh, at, uh, at room air. There is what's called the respiratory quotient, with which equal CO2 production divided oxygen consumption. And a normal person with mixed of diet, it will be 0.8. So every 10 millimeter uh, mercury of oxygen consumed, there will, there will be 8 millimeter mercury of carbon dioxide produced. And other CO2 nearly equal arterial CO2, which normally a normal person around 40 millimeter mercury. So normally for every 40 millimeter mercury uh, CO2 produced into the alveolus, there will be 50 millimeter mercury out of the alveolus to the pulmonary capillary. So the alveolar oxygen tension will be 100 millimeter mercury in normal person at uh, sea level. Alvar gas equation. Uh, so the alvar oxygen tension equal inspired oxygen tension minus corrected alvar CO2 from the previous slide. So the alvar oxygen tension equal inspired oxygen tension minus corrected alvar CO2, which equal PaCO2 divided 0.8, which will equal uh, PaCO2 multiplied by 1.25. So a normal person breathing room air at sea level the alvar oxygen tension equal 150 minus 50 equal 100 millimeter mercury. So this is alvar gas equation. From this equation, we see that hypoventilation lead to, uh, which lead to increase CO2 per C will directly affect oxygenation. So if the, the, the arterial oxygen, uh, the, the arterial carbon dioxide rises to 80 millimeter mercury, the alvar oxygen tension will, will be around 50 in patient breathing room air. And the hypocapnia itself can mask arterial hypoxemia by increasing the, al uh, the alvar oxygen tension by the same equation. So if the PCO2 is 20 by this equation, the alvar oxygen tension will be around 125 in normal person, and the normal PO2 will be around 115 millimeter mercury. So if it is like 85, it appears as normal. However, there is impaired oxygenation. This impairment of oxygenation can be detected by what is called alvar arterial difference. So what is the alvar arterial difference, oxygen difference? It is the difference between alvar and the arterial oxygen tension. Normally in room air, it equal age in years divide four plus four. And this only applied if the patient is in room air. So in a 20 years old person, normal alvar arterial difference will be eight. But in 80 years old person, it will be around 24 millimeter mercury, which is normal for his, for his age. The cause of hypoxemia with normal alvar arterial gradient is either high altitude or pure hypoventilation. Oxygen transport in the blood. There is some important definitions and rules which will aid us to understand how oxygen is transported in the blood. First, when I get a mixture in, is in contact with a liquid like blood, the partial pressure of the particular gas in the liquid is the same as its partial pressure in the gas mixture, assuming the full equilibrium has taken place. Quantity of any of the gas carried by a liquid medium depends on the partial pressure of the gas in the liquid, the capacity of the liquid for that particular gas, and the component of the liquid. So the content of any gas in the liquid, such as blood, equal the amount, the actual amount of the gas contained within the liquid. For uh, oxygen in blood, the content is expressed in milliliter of oxygen per 100 ml blood. So oxygen transported in the blood in two forms, the solvent and the carried on homoglobin. And this can be expressed in this curve. This is the total oxygen content in the blood. We see here that the solvent is very, very minimal amount here. 
and the measure amount is, is carried in hemoglobin. So the solved oxygen, it is the amount of the solvent is proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen with 0.003 ml the solvent in 100 ml for each one millimeter of mercury of partial pressure. So if we have PO2 of around 100 millimeter mercury in the arterial blood, so the solvent oxygen will be 0.3 ml per 100 ml of blood, which will be equal 18 ml per minute, assuming that we have cardiac output around, in, around six liters per minute. This is under normal condition, breathing room air. This will constitute around 7% of oxygen consumption. We know that oxygen consumption is 20, uh, 250 ml, ml per minute. But this very minute amount can be magnified. By breathing 100% of oxygen at atmospheric pressure, this will increase to constitute around 43% of oxygen consumption. And by making it not at atmospheric pressure, but hyperbaric, by increasing the pressure to be too atmospheric, will increase it to uh, approaching uh, the oxygen consumption. And this is can meet the oxygen consumption in certain situations, like carbon monoxide broadening. Oxygen transport in the blood, the carrot, the, the carrot component, which is the major part, because of the structure of homoglobin and it's a binding, he has dynamic uh, behavior with the oxygen binding. This dynamic behavior uh, lead to the, what is called oxygen homoglobin distribution curve. Here in the lower part of the curve, for each binding of oxygen to the homoglobin, this will increase its, uh, its, uh, its rate of binding more and will increase until you're reaching the plateau. Each gram of hemoglobin has the capacity to carry around 1.34 ml of oxygen when fully saturated. Oxygen content of arterial blood at sea level on room air equal carried component and the solvent one. And the carried component, assuming the hemoglobin is 15 gram per deciliter, will equal 1.34 multiplied by 15 multiplied by saturation, which will be around 19.5 ml of oxygen Per 100 ml blood. So the oxygen content of arterial blood will be around 20 ml per 100 ml and will be around 20 ml per one liter. The oxygen delivery equal the cardiac output multiplied by the oxygen content of the arterial blood. So it will be around five multiplied by 200, which will be around 1000 ml per minute. This is the whole oxygen delivery. We consume, the normal person consume around fourth of this, which is 20, uh, 250 ml per minute. The factors what, what determine the oxygen delivery is cardiac output, hemoglobin, and person saturation. Uh, this is the oxyhemoglobin distribution curve, which is the ratio between the uh, partial pressure of, uh, of oxygen and the hemoglobin saturation. This curve, uh, is um, is plateaued at, at around uh, ninety uh, percent saturation, which is equal around sixty millimeter mercury, and this is critical point because below this point the decrease will be rapid. So, in oxygen therapy, we usually we uh, we uh, when PO two less than sixty or saturation less than ninety, we should give oxygen for the patient. There is what's called B50. This curve can be shifted to the right and lead oxygen to be released easily from hemoglobin to tissues or shift to the left and uh, with high affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen. The, there is factors that shift this curve to the right like increase in the hydrogen ion, increase in carbon dioxide, and in, uh, in uh, increase in temperature and increase in two, three diphosphogosate. And the, the opposite of this will lead to the shift to the, to the left. We can know this shifting by what is called the B50. B50 is the PO2 at which 50% of hemoglobin is saturated by oxygen. And we can know it from the, the EBG here from P50. Normally it is uh, 26.5. When it is more, uh, more than this, it, this shift to the right. When it is lower than this, shift to the left. Effect of carbon monoxide on oxygen hemoglobin nutrition curve. In carbon monoxide broadening, the affinity of carbon monoxide for homoglobin is about 200 times greater than that of oxygen. 
and the carbon monoxide shift the distribution curve to the left. So at the uh, lung level, carbon monoxide prevent oxygen binding uh, into the blood, and at tissue level, it prevent oxygen unloading at tissue, which will lead to significant hypoxia. Hypoxemia and the hypoxia. These are uh, different terms. Hypoxia is the reduction below normal level of oxygen in tissue, recognized by signs of ischemia, lactic acidosis, cardiac ischemia, or neurological dysfunction. Hypoxemia is defined as the reduction below normal level of oxygen in arterial blood. Uh, and this can lead to hypoxia if severe, and this is one mechanism of hypoxia, and it may be asymptomatic if mild and gradual onset. Pulmonary vascular response to hypoxia. When there is certain area in the lung uh, has low uh, PO2, there, there will be what is called pulmonary vasoconstriction. When this is localized, it will be beneficial because it will direct the blood to the well ventilated area. But if it is generalized, it will be detrimental and lead to pulmonary hypertension, and this can be augmented by respiratory acidosis. Cause of tissue hypoxia can be either arterial hypoxemia, shock and hemoglobin effect, and misuse like cyanide poisoning. Uh, shock and hemoglobin effect, circulatory hypoxia, so in low cardiac output and systemic hypovolemia, uh, and the arterial insufficiency of peripheral tissue lead to tissue hypoxia. Abnormal in blood oxygen transport, like in severe anemia or hemoglobinosy, can lead to uh, tissue hypoxia. And the maldistribution, like in certs and septic shock, there will be maldistribution and shunting of blood at the level of the tissues from arterial side to venous side and lead to tissue hypoxia. Main mechanisms of arterial hypoxemia, there are, uh, <clears throat> there are five mechanisms of arterial hypoxemia, either low ventilation perfusion, shun, which is an extreme of low uh, VQ, diffusion limitation, hypercarbia and hyperventilation, and decreased and spread oxygen tension. We see here shunt has minimal improvement with oxygenation. So when we're giving oxygen to a patient and there is minimal or no improvement in, in arterial oxygen tension, we suspect shunt at this level. These mechanisms rarely exist in isolation. Usually these mechanisms are in combination. We can see shunt with low VQ uh, and sometimes diffusion limitation with hypercarbia. So usually they are combined. Low perfusion, uh, low ventilation perfusion. Normally in the lung, uh, this is the most common cause of hypoxemia in clinical practice. Normally in the lung, the ventilation increasing from the, the top to the base. But the perfusion also increases from top to the base, but its increase is more than ventilation. So in the top of the lung, there will be increased ventilation in relation to the, uh, the perfusion. And in the bottom, there will be a decrease in, in ventilation in relation to the perfusion. This is a normal lung, and this is responsible of part of the arterial, of the alveolar arterial gradient, okay? But this increase doesn't compensate for this decrease. Why? Because of the oxyhemoglobin distribution curve. The, the areas in the apex are at the upper part of the curve, which is the plateau part, and the lower part of the lung are at the, this part, is the steep one. So the decrease here is always over than the, the increase in this area. So usually there is, uh, at the lung there is a mismatch, but this is physiological. In morbidly obese patients, this, uh, the, at the lung base, this will be augmented, this uh, decrease in uh, ventilation perfusion and uh, will lead to low VQ. In uh, airway disease like asthma and COPD, also there will be decrease in ventilation and lead to low VQ. In pulmonary embolism, th there will be uh, blood shifted from area of pulmonary embolism segment to other areas and lead to increase in perfusion. And this, uh, at the end, will lead to low VQ. So low ventilation perfusion is one of the most common cause of hypoxemia in, in clinical practice. Shunt. 
This is mixed venous blood completely bypasses alveoli and is not exposed to alveolar oxygen tension. There is some pseudo shunt. This, this is shunt from the pulmonary, uh, this post pulmonary capillary entry of venous blood into the systemic uh, arterial blood from the bronchial veins or thebesian veins. And this is estimated at least than 7% of the cardiac output. There is pathological shunt, which may be intrapulmonary or intracardiac. So shunt can be divided, pathological shunt can be divided either vascular shunt, this vascular shunt can be pulmonary or extrapulmonary, or brinkimal shunt. The brinkimal cause of shunt like pneumonia, ERDS, and any alveolar floating. The pulmonary vascular shunt like an EV malformation and the hepatopulmonary syndrome. The extra pulmonary vascular shunt, like in right to left shunt through the patient ducts or previous or ACD. Uh, what is characteristic of shunt is uh, minimal response to increase the FI2. In this curve, this is the shunt fraction. If we have 50% shunt here, even if we increase the FI2 to 100%, there will be very little increase in the arterial oxygen tension. Diffusion limitation. This occurs when the PO2 in the pulmonary capillary blood doesn't reach equilibrium with alveolar gas. Normally, <clears throat> there is transit time of the RBCs in the pulmonary capillary, which equal 0.75 seconds. Equilibrium occurs at, at the first third of this pathway. Diffusion limitation, usually no, not causing a hypoxia, a hypoxemia during rest because there is reserve for around uh, two thirds of this transit. But during exercise uh, and decrease in this transit time, like in a loss of capillary or extreme exercise, th this diffusion limitation will lead to hypoxemia. Or if there are other mechanisms of, uh, of hypoxemia, like uh, decreased alveolar BO2, or uh, there is uh, decrease in the mixed venous oxygen tension, like in shock state. Hypoventilation from the alveolar gas equation. Any increase in CO2 will lead to decrease in the alveolar oxygen tension and lead to decrease in the arterial oxygen tension. So in hypoventilation for each 10, M, 10 millimeter mercury, increase in CO2 will decrease the arterial oxygen tension by 12.5 millimeter mercury. Approach to determine the, core, the mechanism of hypoxemia. First, if we, if we have hypoxemia, which is decreased either saturation or PO2 in the arterial blood, are there response to supplemental oxygen or no? If there is sub, uh, response to uh, supplemental oxygen, we should think about low ventilation perfusion or hypoventilation. We should do EBG and calculate the alveolar arterial difference if applicable. If it is normal, so it is pure hypoventilation. If it is increased, so it is low ventilation perfusion, like in asthma, COPD, or pulmonary embolism. If there is no or minimal response to supplemental oxygen, so this is shunt. We should go for chest X ray. If it is clear, so mostly it is intracardiac shunt or AV malformation, but we should also consider PE and the differential diagnosis. If it is focal obesity, we should consider pneumonia and diathlexis. If it is diffuse opacities, we should think about pulmonary edema and DRDS. Hypoxemia and COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 can induce significant hypoxemia sometimes without dyspnea or other respiratory symptoms. Possible reason for the lack of dyspnea despite hypoxemia in some COVID patients. Insensitivity of the hypoxemic ventilatory response until arterial PO2 drops to quite low values. There is large variability in response between uh, uh, individuals as regards the hypoxemia. And some patient who are, has advanced age or have, have diabetes, there is decreased ventilatory response to hypoxemia. And uh, the decrease in CO2 by hyperventilation can blunt the ventilatory response of hypoxemia. So we can face COVID-19 patients with uh, severe hypoxemia and there is no dyspnea. Mechanism of hypoxemia in COVID-19 patients, mainly a shunt. Second is low ventilation perfusion because of pulmonary valve dilatation. And PE on top of COVID can cause hypoxemia. 
Hypoxemia management. If we are facing any patient with hypoxemia, we should assess the patient, airway, breathing, circulation, disability. Uh, management of the primary disease should be considered in our management. We'll increase the inspired oxygen by either non-invasively, by uh, uh, non-replacing the mask, face mask, and we'll discuss uh, this later, or invasively if the patient needs like, uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. Lateral positioning can help sometimes in, uh, in hypoxemia. Lateral positioning can improve oxygenation in several types of unilateral lung disease. If we have unilateral lung disease like pneumonia, uh, post thoracotomy status or pure infusion. If the patient is lying on the healthy side, this will improve the ventilation perfusion and will improve oxygenation. But take care. In case of hemopsis, the affected lung and the affected lung is known, keep the diseased lung down for isolation of that lung. Proning, either awake proning, the patient is awoke, or in mechanically ventilated patients with severe RDS with pH threshold less than 150. This reduce, uh, reduce the low VQ areas and chunk in proning and improve the VQ. Improving the mixed venous partial pressure of oxygen, like in choke state, how we can improve the, the mixed venous blood by either improve oxygen delivery or decrease oxygen consumption. Improving the delivery by the improving of cardiac output, we can give anotropic support of to hemoglobin to a certain level, if the patient has severe anemia, you should optimize this, or decrease oxygen consumption by deep sedation and even paralysis, and sometimes hypothermia. PEEP. PEEP usually uh, avoid atlectis and improve uh, ventilation perfusion. But uh, sometimes we facing some situation when we give the patient PEEP by non-invasive ventilation, there is paradoxical response and the hypoxemia is worsening. And if this happened, we should think about either impairment of the cardiac output by this, by this beep, which will decrease the venous tear and will decrease cardiac output and the mixed venous oxygen tension. And actually this will lead to hypoxemia or redirecting of perfusion from more compliant areas to consolidated area. The, the beep will, uh, will increase the pressure inside the healthy alveoli and this will compress the, the intra-alveolar vessels and shift the blood to non-compliant area. Or if there's complications from the non-invasive ventilation like pneumothorax, or an opening of a patent form an eval. Uh, if the patient has patent form an eval and they give PEEP, and this will increase the pulmonary artery pressure, and this sometimes lead to opening of this patent form an eval and lead to hypoxemia. Oxygen therapy, it is supplementation of oxygen concentration greater than 21%. Oxygen is a drug with a prescription form and side effects. Supplemental oxygen remains among the most common therapies provided in the inpatient setting. The aim of resuscitation in acutely ill patient is to assure uh, patient safety and optimize oxygen delivery to tissues. Oxygen therapy improves oxygen delivery and uh, reverse tissue ischemia in most of acutely ill patients. Oxygen delivery, this is the fa factors that affect oxygen delivery, cardiac output, hemoglobin, and the oxygen content of the blood. And oxygen therapy can improve saturation and PO2 and indirectly can improve cardiac output in patients with ischemic heart disease. Indications of oxygen therapy, there is accepted indication like documented hypoxemia defined by PO2 less than 60 or saturation less than 90%, acute care situation in which hypoxemia is suspected, severe trauma, acute MI with hypoxemia, low cardiac output with metabolic acidosis, hypotension, which is decreased stroke blood pressure less than 100 uh, millimeter mercury. There is questionable indications, acute MI without hypoxemia, dyspnea without hypoxemia, and sickle cell pain crisis and pneumothorax. Oxygen therapy is essential practice, not well practiced. A survey was done in the UK about oxygen therapy in which 50 qualified medical and nursing staff working in acute areas were asked about oxygen masks and the consideration of oxygen delivered by each. And also asked what, which mask was most appropriate for a range of clinical situations. The results were many staff couldn't name the different types of oxygen mask and the difference between oxygen flow and the concentration was poorly understood. And one third of healthcare workers chose 28% venturi mask for an annual asthmatic. So, Misunderstanding of oxygen therapy is widespread, and the result is that many patients are treated suboptimally. 
auction delivery devices, we have either high flow devices or low flow devices. And this is divided according to the uh, delivering of the, the ventilator requirement. High flow device deliver entire ventilator requirement, but uh, low flow device deliver a proportion of the entire ventilator requirement. This also can be called controlled auction or fixed performance. And this is uncontrolled auction or variable performance. These examples for low flow devices like nasal cannula, simple test mask, and another uh, breathing mask. And this example is for high flow device like Venturi mask, high flow nasal cannula, and CBAB. How, uh, how the, the main ventilation af uh, affect the low flow system? In this example, we'll see patient with COPD presented with spinal stress. He's taking around 30 liters per minute. This is ventilatory mid volume. And he was bought on two liter per minute oxygen. And the same patient after relieving of the respiratory stress, he is now taking a five liter per minute, which is his ventilatory mid volume, okay? And the both are taking the same flow, two liter per minute. Here, patient with respiratory stress, he will take uh, two liter pure oxygen, 100%, and the remaining of the 30, which is 28, will come from room air. So at the end, the FIO2 will be around 26%. The same patient after relief of the stress, and now he, he's, he, he take, he's taking the same flow of oxygen, two liter, but he will take two liter from 100% FIO2, and the remaining of this five, three will take, be taken from the room air. So he will take, if they are mixed, he will take around 53%. The same patient with the same oxygen flow, but in different made ventilation has different FIO2. This is the low flow system. In high flow system, the high flow will deliver uh, flow more than this. So all the patient flow will, will be taken from the mask. Low flow device, first of which is uh, nasal cannula. It's usually set from one to six liters per minute. It is a low flow system and they give variable FIO2, and we have known from the previous slide. For patient with normal rate and depth of breathing, each one liter of nasal uh, oxygen increases FIO2 approximately 4%. So, for example, if patient using nasal cannula at 4 liter, it is estimated that FIO2 will be approximately 37%. It is convenient, comfortable, allow eating and drinking and the lower risk for aspiration, so suitable for conscious patients with stroke if in need of oxygen. Simple face mask, usually set from five to 12 liters per minute. It is low flow system also, and give variable FIO2. Shouldn't be set below five liters per minute because the risk of rebreathing of carbon dioxide. So if need less than five liters, we should go for the nasal cannula. It delivers around 50% of FI2, but varies according to the oxygen flow, the mask volume, is it large or small, the extent of air leakage, and the patient breathing better. Reservoir bag mask, either partial rebreath mask or non rebreathing mask, visually set from 10 to 15 liters per minute. The reservoir should be filled with oxygen before the mask is placed to the patient. This is the reservoir bag. The bag shouldn't deflate by more than two thirds with each breath in order to be effective. First is the partial rebreath mask, which give around 7 to 80% FI2. This is the mask. There is no, no valves here, but the, the first third of the separation, will go, which has high FI2, will go to the back, and the brain will rebreathe from oxygen and from the back. Useful in traveling with a cylinder, the first one third of the paint exhaled gas fills the reservoir bag, but as this is primary from the anatomical test space, it contains little CO2. The paint then inspires the mixture of exhaled gas and the fresh air, mainly oxygen. And now replacing the mask, it gives around 80% to 95% uh, FIO2. There is here valves here and here. When the patient is expiring, this valve is closed and the expired air goes through this valve. When he take breathing, this valve, this, this valve will be closed, and he take breathing from from the bag. Okay. If the oxygen flow rate and the oxygen reservoir are insufficient to meet the respiratory demand of the patient, 
with a particular high inspiratory rate, the bag may collapse. If the patient is in severe distress, he may collapse this bag. So to prevent this, the reservoir bag mask must be used with a minimum of 10 liter per minute of oxygen, and one of these exhalation valves should be removed. Hey, two devices, like what is called air entrapment mask or venturi mask. This is the principle of venturi mask. Here, oxygen come here through a narrow lumen, and suddenly there is a, a large lumen. This creates negative pressure here and will suck air. So, say the flow here is low, like from uh, two to 10 liter, the flow here will be high, but it is mixed it, oxygen and air. So, because if this high flow, the, the oil and spirituality demand will be taken from the mask. And so it is controlled oxygen. This example, this is the flow rate to the mask. It, each, uh, each venturi mask has certain color by certain FiO2. And by, to put the, the mask on certain, uh, on certain flow. Okay. And this is the flow going to the patient. We see here, the flow here nearly more than 30 liters per minute. And this will cover the inspiratory demand of the patient. So it is controlled for this. This is uh, uh, the, can be different color like this, or can be adjusted like this. So flu is not the same as concentration. We see low flu mask like nasal cannula can deliver high FI2 reaching around 50%. And the high flu mask like venturi mask can deliver low FI2 like 24% of FI2. So on prescribing oxygen, we should specify type of the mask, specify the flow of oxygen, and specify our target situation. For example, to modify oxygen by nasal cannula, this is the mask, this is the flow, one to five liter, and this is target saturation from 94 to 98. Or to modify oxygen by venturi mask, 28%, and titrate from 24 to 35% to keep our saturation from 88 to 92. Oxygen cylinder and duration of oxygen supply. These examples of oxygen cylinder in common use, the most of them are size E and size H. So, uh, how oxygen supply time by an oxygen cylinder? Each cylinder has capacity with certain volume of oxygen in liter when fully pressurized at uh, 2020 pounds per square inch. For example, size E has, uh, when fully pressurized at this pressure, will have 680 liter. And the H center has pressure meter. No, no. The amount of oxygen. He probably wants to watch movies. No, that's okay. But, may, but now you're not working tomorrow, so maybe you can get some of it done tomorrow. Yeah, no, I might get some done if you want to. It's okay now, Dr. Adel, you can resume. So, <clears throat> so uh, each standard has a pressure meter like this. So the amount of oxygen in, in a cylinder equal its capacity, this one. Is okay. We hear you, Dr. Adel, just open the camera. Open the camera, okay. Sorry, it was off accidentally. Hmm? Uh, Your uh, camera was off accidentally. Okay, no problem, no problem. So each cylinder has a pressure meter like this, okay? So the amount of oxygen in, in a cylinder equal its capacity. Yeah, equal its man. capacity uh, multiplied by the actual pressure divide uh, 2,200. And the oxygen supply per minute by an oxygen cylinder equal amount of oxygen in, in liter, amount of oxygen in, in liter per flow. 
So this example will uh, clarify more, okay? So if we have each cylinder like this one, and the pressure inside it is 1,200 pressure uh, uh, pound per square inch, for intra-hospital trans transfer of a patient requiring oxygen around five liter per minute. So the amount of oxygen in the E cylinder equal uh, 680, which is its capacity, multiplied by 1,200 divided 2,020. Uh, 200, which will equal three, uh, 370 liter. The oxygen supply in time by this cylinder will equal this amount of liter, 370, divide the flow of the patient, which is five. So this cylinder, if, 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 if put in this flow, will, uh, will keep the patient on oxygen for 74 minutes. But usually we have this time for safety. Because during the transport, there may be increase in the flow or something happened. So it, for safety, it will keep this patient for around 35 minutes. Heated high flow zone cannula. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the heated high flow zone cannula. There is oxygen blender, which will blend oxygen with, with air and go, uh, go uh, through heated humidifier and going to the, to the patient. There is physiological benefit of high frequency camera, like it accurately delivers uh, high FI2. A small amount of theoretical peep, peep one uh, centimeter water for each 10 liter of uh, permeate flow, wash out of carbon dioxide from this space, and decrease the work of breathing. So it is more comfortable than another conventional oxygen therapy device. But take care, high frequency cannula is considered to be a regenerating procedure. So if patient was suspected infection need airborne hydration, we should put the patient in a negative pressure room. Mm -hmm. The indication of high frequency cannula, it usually indicated in, in her hypoxemic respiratory failure, there is emerging evidence that high frequency cannula is safe and they may benefit when compared with non-invasive ventilation in patient with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure from pneumonia and non-mild DRDS, when PIF ratio is less than 200. It has a role in decreasing the intubation rate when there is an absolute or relative contraindication to non-invasive medical ventilation. The major benefit of high frequency cannula is to reduce the number of patients who require intubation and medical ventilation. Indicated in acute respiratory failure from <clears throat> pneumonia, ARDS, following surgery, post-operative, acute and chronic hypoxemic lung disease, and in end of life. May be considered for hypoxemic respiratory failure from immunocompromised patients, pre-intubation, post-extubation, nice few patients, and pre-procedure like bronchoscopy or endoscopy. Shouldn't to be used in hypoxemic respiratory failure from uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema or type two respiratory failure. This is due to limited strong evidence till now for these two situations. Drawbacks of oxygen and hyperoxia. Oxygen can lead absorption at lexis, ARDS and the bronch uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, if, if high FI2. Hyperoxia and other system, it will lead to systemic vasoconstriction, and there is uh, uh, bad outcome in post cardiac arrest uh, and ROSC. If they are giving if I would, uh, if their uh, PO2 more than 300 millimeter mercury, and also in post traumatic brain injury, there is evidence that if the PO2 is more than 200 millimeter mercury, there is bad outcome, and in post MI, there is also bad outcome if there is hyperoxy. Non hemodified oxygen, it is more evident to harm an artificial airway if the paint has to request me because the, the, the oxygen will bypass the nasopharynx, so it should be, should be humidified. Hypercapnia and treating of chronic CO2 retention and, the hyper, and the hyperoxia. If the patient has chronic CO2 retention, like in these situations, uh, COPD and defects of obstructive lung disease, cystic fibrosis and the bronchitis exacerbation, or morbidly obese, and in neuromuscular disease and chest wall deformity, these patients are at risk for hypercapnia if, they are, if we are uh, fully corrected the, the oxygen. And in this patient, there is option alert card will be with them that is stating that if the, this patient has deterioration and late oxygen should be given a venturi mask, controlled oxygen to keep saturation from 
like 88 to 92 during reservation. What is the cause of hypercapnia and setting of chronic sutural tension and, and hyperoxia? The mechanism, if we have this uh, bronchiole, and this bronchiole has uh, obstruction like in COPD patients, there is what is called the protective vasoconstrictive uh, response from the pulmonary arteriole. It will constrict. So it will deliver blood so will, to well ventilated area. So it will keep uh, ventilation perfusion matching. But if this uh, was high, with, with full correction of hypoxemia, this arteriole will dilate. So this will increase the space ventilation. And we know that this space Ventilation, when it increases, it will decrease alpha ventilation, and this will increase CO2. The second effect is what's called the Haldane effect. Hemoglobin, the deoxygenated, the, the, the hemoglobin, when it is deoxygenated, it is carry more CO2. So when it is oxygenated, it is released CO2 in the blood. So if we give oxygen, it will release CO2 in the blood and, and increase uh, PCO2. BCO2, uh, the partial bridge of CO2. Also, respiratory center depression because the, the center respiratory center is uh, is adaptive to the chronic hypercapnia, and the peripheral chemoreceptor is responsive to the, the hypoxemia, the mild hypoxemia. So, if you if we fully correct this hypoxemia, it will lead to respiratory center depression. But hypoxemia kills. There have been cases of negligence in which doctors have withheld oxygen therapy from acutely ill patients due to an unfounded fear of exacerbating hypercapnia. So the British Society in 2017 put a algorithm for oxygen in acutely ill patients. So in acutely ill patients, we will start by reservoir bag mask, 15 liter per minute, aiming our target saturation from 94 to 98%. And after the stabilization of the patient, we'll see Patient now is not acutely ill, and does he has any risk factor for hypoxemic hypercapnia, like in this group of patients? If he has, so we'll decrease the FIO2 by using a Venturi mask, starting by Venturi 28%, and do a EBG, aiming for our uh, arterial oxygen tension around 60 millimeter mercury and normal pH. And we should consider non invasive ventilation in acute respiratory acidosis after formal therapy. If the patient uh, has no risk factor for hypercapnia, so we will use bag mask, simple face mask, or nasal cannula to keep oxygen saturation from 94 to 98%. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adel. Uh, it wasn't an easy topic, and you made it very uh, easy. And um, um, I have a Question at the moment. Uh, so, for how long you can use the non-invasive ventilation to improve hypoxemia in COVID-19 patients? Non-invasive ventilation. Yeah. Usually, uh, the use of non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19, there is evidence that CPAP is better than non-invasive ventilation, especially if the patient has high uh, in a special drive, because this high drive will will increase uh, the acute lung injury. Uh, but uh, we know that using invasive mechanical ventilation on COVID-19 patient has bad outcome in most of patient. Really, we, in some patient in, in our center, we, we can use it for, for days. As the patient is stable and no, no deterioration, we can, we can, uh, we can use it uh, in conjunction with high fluid cannula. But really, we, we are so, so, uh, late in, in, in using uh, invasive mechanical ventilation for these patients. And did you see any increased incidence of uh, pneumothorax and the pneumomedestine, uh, especially yes, yes. COVID-19 patients? We, we have seen a lot of patients with bad trauma, pneumomedestine, uh, especially pneumomedestine. Yeah. And what do you do then? What's your approach? Really we, we, we observe at the point it's stable hemodynamics. Yeah. And uh, we observe the patients, and a lot of them in, in pneumodiastinum, it's, it's going uh, conservatively. There is no intervention. Okay. And you don't decrease the pressures or uh, intubate them? Yes, this conservative management, we monitor them if there is increase or hemodynamic instability, but re, uh, re, we haven't faced this uh, situation. In, uh, the hemodynamic instability due to bar trauma in, in pneumodiastinum. Okay. 
And um, how can you improve the ventilation perfusion mismatch and refractory hypoxemia caused by the COVID-19? Uh, our proning is one of the options that if we, uh, and if it started early and uh, for prolonged time, really it, it will benefit these patients. Uh, and if he is mechanically ventilated with, uh, with severe ERDS, uh, we can go for proning if he is ventilated. And in some cases with refractory hypoxemia and he is eligible for ECMO, we can go for ECMO for these patients. After proning? It's after proning, yes. Do you have a cut point on the number of proning sessions before you go for ECMO? Uh, really, I don't... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, really, for, for the last three, uh, two years, I haven't, uh, I haven't done an ICU. Uh, I was in the palm of the department in the inpatient, not an ICU uh, hearing. I know, it's, no worries. It's fine. And... Um... Um, as well, is there any rule for the right-sided inodilators and improving the uh, refractory hypoxemia caused by the COVID-19 or by the uh, complications from COVID-19, such as the pulmonary embolism? Really, if, if, if patient has, you know that pulmonary embolism in patients is a problem if, if submassive or massive, because mechanical ventilation itself can, can make a detrimental effect for these patients. And uh, we use uh, inhaled nitro oxide in this patient with effect to hypoxemia. Yeah. We, we... And then when to decide to use ECMO? Hmm? When to decide to use ECMO in this case? There is a logarithm uh, made by the uh, Saudi so Society for, for, for ECMO. Usually, young patient with one organ failure uh, early. If it is late, it is really late. It, it, it will be late for, for the patient. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, well, from the uh, question box here, I have a question about uh, management of severe flyle chest and refractory hypoxemia. Is it, isn't it corrected by mechanical ventilation? Refractory hypoxemia? Yeah. The, the, the problem with flyle chest, you know that there is, uh, there is trauma to the chest by the, the segment, okay? And there is a uh, VQ mismatch. Both the pressure ventilation, and the splinting of the chest is one option for, for management, either non-invasively or invasively. But at the start, uh, if, the, if, the, if the segment is small, we can use uh, uh, local anesthesia for some patients, and we can start non-invasive ventilation for these patients. And sometimes they pass with this. Okay, uh, another question from the question box here. Uh, do you have experience with the use of helium or nitric oxide? Nitro oxide in an ICU. It is used in our ICU. Okay. And another question about the intraoperative management of severe resistant bronchospasms. I haven't faced this situation really. Yeah. Because so, uh, sorry, it was just in the question box. Uh, that's not related to this lecture. Um, so uh, I would say uh, thank you very uh, much. In this bronchospasm, we will use bronchodilators. Okay. Nobilized yeah. with uh, honest uh, anti mascarinics and you can give steroids and do it your response. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to thank all the speakers today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Adel, you made it very easy for this kind of very hard topic in the physics and the use of uh, different devices and the cut limit for the oxygen, especially during the COVID 19. And that's different between the countries depending on. Uh, their logistics of what they have and we heard about uh, the cut of oxygen supplies in a lot of uh, disciplines so you illustrated that very well so that can give you uh, a monitor for the people for how long they can use their specific devices and uh, suppliers um, again uh, thank you Dr. Doyle as well for your nice lecture today it was very easily uh, illustrated and um, you easily went through the devices uh, for the uh, difficult airway management. Uh, Dr. Saad, would you like to add anything? Uh, I would like to add to announce that uh, 14th of uh, November, we will have again uh, Prof. John Doyle and Dr. Adel Hamada. Prof. John Doyle will give the safety during uh, anesthesiology, safety history and update and everything. And Dr. Adel Hamada will discuss the blood gas uh, explanation. And uh, from me, and thank you very much for all speakers, for all 
colleagues attending tonight and to make uh, our webinar supported and running all the session. Uh, thank you so much from here. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, just uh, enjoy the winter uh, timing next week. So um, for all people in Europe, we are going to be one hour more. Uh, so you will sleep one more hour uh, next uh, Sunday. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you.